All right, Ron, and thanks for that today. And uh, what a day uh, in markets once again. And um, I just came off of CNBC about an hour ago just talking about what's going on in the market. So we'll cover some of that, uh, what we're seeing in the marketplace. We're going to start with the macro landscape, but uh, really, really, really challenging time in the bond market. And from our internal estimates and what we see on the, the Bloomberg U.S. aggregate after today, uh, we're probably looking to be down uh, the index at over 15% on a year-to-date basis. So uh, the carnage continues in that market. So let's let's talk about what we can do about it at this point. And we titled this uh, webcast, The Great Rotation. Uh, shout out to one of my colleagues who came up with the idea and just thinking about, you know, it is time to be rotating throughout various parts of the marketplace. And so uh, we heard about this phrase many years ago where people were talking about buying stocks for safety uh, and capital uh, and, and income and, you know, avoiding the bond market um, as not having the potential to either generate uh, income or capital gains. And what a difference really 12 months makes today. And so what I want to talk about is the great rotation and some potential ways to really help stomach some of the volatility out there in the marketplace and what really the opportunity set that lies in fixed income today. And I'll be back in two weeks uh, talking about the same topic again, uh, probably have a, a lot more updated data just given how fluid markets are. Uh, but I think it's very important to really assess some of the landscape today, what the setup looks like, and how to potentially capitalize on that to try to uh, claw some of this uh, returns back. So uh, as we all know, uh, we've seen the GDP prints from earlier in the year. Uh, the first two quarters have indeed uh, shown us a negative real GDP print. Um, you know, some people call that the heuristic for thinking about um, a recession here in the U.S. Uh, but what's very interesting about this, if you look at GDP over the long-term trend line, is that, you know, there was a very consistent uh, trend line growth at, in the post-World War II era. And if you started from about 1950 and you ran the trend line, you'd see there, this is done in logarithmic scale because of the long time frame and compounding, but you can see there that the growth rate was relatively consistent. And something really changed at the global financial crisis. Uh, we went through quantitative easing. Uh, we threw lots of debt at the marketplace, um, you know, trying to uh, manage, you know, manage interest rate policy to try to stimulate growth. And notice the slope of that line. Not only did it deviate uh, from that dotted line, the long-term trend, but notice that the slope of that line decelerated. And so our growth potential in the QE era went down meaningfully. And so you can see here, even with all the policies we enacted and you know, the, the significant drawdown we saw during the pandemic, we just really got back to that trend line growth, not the post-World War II era growth rate, but really where we are from that kind of post-GFC era. And unfortunately, third quarter GDP, if you take a look at it, uh, the estimates, there's updated estimates with some new economic day data today uh, that the GDP now estimate is for a paltry 30 basis points on an annualized basis for the third quarter. So definitely the economy has kind of hit stall speed here. Uh, the question is, you know, with the current level of interest rates, the Fed's hawkish behavior, will that allow us to continue to uh, get back to this trend line growth or is it going to derail the system? So let's look at what the economic data is showing us and let's look how markets have responded. So again, to put it in perspective, the, the drawdown in GDP, uh, what you see here is the last couple of uh, recessions that we've had, the drawdown in GDP has been more meaningful uh, than what we've seen in kind of the pre prior recessions. And so if you think about what's happened, you can see there are blips down in GDP. Uh, you know, it, it, most people are, are amazed when they go back and look at uh, the recession from the, the tech wreck and what we saw in the early 2000s. But it wasn't really a broad-based economy. It was just the financial markets were really in ruin. Uh, and then we had some challenges late in 01 and early 02. Uh, but you can see here that we're, we're kind of on pace for that. Is it a head fake uh, from the recession? Um, you know, potentially it's starting to look more and more likely by the day that US economy is indeed in a recession. And there are some bright spots in the economy, but broad measures are definitely indicating that we are continuing to slow down here. And one way about thinking about this, since GDP is a backward looking indicator, is to look at something called the economic data change. And Citigroup puts together these time series. Well, what they do is they take a look at an amalgamation of various economic data um, and they compare the what, what the readings are on the economic data today relative to where it was on average over the last 12 months. So you can think of it as kind of an, a, a velocity or a signal saying, where are we today relative to where we've been on average 
over the last 12 months. And not shockingly, um, given the amount of stimulus we put in the marketplace, uh, we did see an uptick in, in economic activity due to the monetary and fiscal stimulus. But at some point, you know, uh, it's going to be hard on a comparable basis. And so we've seen that deceleration throughout the year. And if you look at the black line, which shows the U.S., you can see it's really been this stabilization of continuing to underperform where we were. Not shockingly, we had a very high growth rate last year. Uh, we had some record corporate profits out there as well. And so it's a very difficult uh, environment to have on a, on a year-over-year comparison. But I guess the one bright spot you could say here is looking at that orange line is that there is someone that is really accelerating, and that is China. And so, again, just given the amount of lockdowns they've had, the, the on the, the open the economy, close the economy uh, that they've seen there, and by reopening the economy, they're starting to get a little more data. Yes, there's been some credit impulses there as well, but potentially, you know, maybe China can help uh, stave off some of the stuff we're seeing on these global issues. Uh, but again, uh, let's focus back here more in the U.S. And so if we look at also uh, the data, another way of thinking about that, remember markets uh, price things from an expectation standpoint, right? So it's not always about how the data performs, but data performs relative to expectations. And so uh, City also puts out a, a commensurate data series where they measure the surprise in the data. And notice that the, the economy, uh, the economic data was surprising to the upside in the first quarter of this year. Uh, we hit that rough patch up really just kind of towards the end of the first quarter uh, where it, it kind of um, uh, underperformed expectations in a meaningful manner. And you could argue that maybe we're just kind of on par with expectations right now. So again, maybe the economy is doing a little bit better than people ha are thinking about it in there. But also this is an example of what's going on with people thinking about markets as well. And so remember this sentiment uh, can be a very heavy overhang in the marketplace. It drives euphoria, but it also brings kind of negative sentiment to the market as well. And so uh, that negative sentiment is indicative of what we're finding from economists uh, out there. I know it's always dangerous to rely on, on forecasts from economists. Uh, but what I wanted to show this chart for a reason, and I like to show this chart, is to remind everyone what GDP growth looked like in the post-GFC era. And if you look at the ranges there from 2010 all the way through like 2019, where we had the greatest economy ever, uh, as some people called it, you had a growth rate between 1.8% and 2.9%. So this real GDP growth of four, five, six, that's something we haven't seen since the early 2000s and the late 90s. And so again, uh, I think uh, if we think about our potential, our capacity, uh, looking at some of the overhangs we have within the demographics within this country and the lack of immigration, uh, what you'll see here is that you know getting back in that range is probably where the optimal capacity is. And you, you see what happened in 2020, we overshot back with all the stimulus in 2021, but look at the deceleration of these forecasts in 2022. I'm not even gonna look at the purple line on 2023, uh, but notice here that you're seeing that, again, below trend line growth. And you even heard this from the chairman uh, at the FOMC meeting last Wednesday, uh, when he put out that, uh, when he said that, you know, not only do they have these higher dot plots, they're forecasting lower growth rates. They think inflation is going to come back in line. They're forecasting higher unemployment. So they are indicating that they believe that the policies that they are trying to implement will put the brakes on things. And that's because they want to be perceived to be inflation fighters. And so uh, you're seeing this degradation in the data set, which means you should be starting to think about recession for 2023. And again, whether or not we hit it in 2022 or, or, or not is to be seen. Uh, it'll rely significantly on the consumer and the labor markets. Uh, but at this stage, we, our antenna are up significantly in thinking about recession risk in 2023. And the good news is, if you're thinking about that, uh, we do have some ideas out there and things we've done to the portfolio as of late that we think can help uh, kind of mitigate some of that downside if indeed that starts to play out, that thesis plays out. And so, uh, again, GDP is a very slow indicator. Uh, I, I remember uh, Chair, Chairwoman Yellen uh, said it was a noisy indicator. I, I don't know if it's very noisy, uh, but indeed uh, it is lagged, right? And we only get it on a quarterly basis and we get some revisions along the way. So the Fed did create something out of the New York arm of the Fed called the Weekly Economic Index, which measures overall economic activity. And why I like this indicator is that it gives you a sense of directionality of GDP. And the bad news here is that we are continuing to decelerate. Um, you know, if you think about the year-over-year -year numbers within them, 
Uh, you know, you have the two negative prints uh, from the from the, uh, the the first two quarters of this year. But again, you see that deceleration going down as well. So I think this is why investors should be thinking about potentially: um, Are we going to enter an economic recession here in the U.S.? Um, you know, some argue we're already there. It doesn't show completely we are there yet, uh, but there's a lot of signs of some harbingers of bad news out there. So, again, given some of the yields and things we find in the marketplace, uh, we do think that there is the potential uh, to benefit or at least try to insulate uh, investors' overall portfolios against some catastrophic events. And uh, another, another kind of harbinger of bad things to come is something called the leading economic indicator. And the leading economic indicator is, again, another amalgamation of, of metrics it uses 10 metrics together to come up with uh, what they call the leading economic indicator, and that's the red line. Um, another thing to kind of watch to see the directionality of that is to, to look at the leading economic indicator change on a six-month basis, annualize that to kind of see the directionality. And you can see here that whenever we've went below zero, we haven't always went into a recession. Uh, but when you've done so in a, in a value roughly in this range we see, it usually leads you to that recession. And so, again, with this deceleration at this point in time, uh, it does look like potentially a recession is on the horizon. And so um, this is a chart we've used for, for a while now, just talking about how accommodative the Fed had been uh, relative to essentially the inflationary environment. And so this is uh, calculated, the real Fed funds rate in this, in this uh, graphic is calculated as the current Fed funds uh, effective rate uh, less the, the trailing 12-month CPI. And if you, the, why they think this is very important today, if you listen to what the chairman said during the Q&A uh, at the FOMC last week, he said that we need to get U.S. interest rates to be positive on a real basis across the curve, right? And that includes the Fed funds rate. And so historically, you know, when you think about the Fed funds and, and fighting inflation, the Fed funds rate usually goes above the inflation rate. So the bad news is there's a big gap here. You can see 590 basis points or so. Uh, but the, the positive news is that inflation is likely to start to gravitate downwards. There is going to be some pressure uh, on some of the inflation data, which, again, has elevated our probability of recession here at double line. But ultimately, you know, it's not that the Fed needs to get to an 8 9% kind of Fed funds rate. If those two things kind of mesh together, potentially the path that the Fed laid out uh, is one that will get you to that very restrictive policy level. So uh, let's talk about inflation. It's on everyone's mind. Uh, it's what's rattling the bond market at this stage where uh, we were told for you know 18 months that it's just transitory. And now all of a sudden, it's, it's, um, it's like an, a five alarm fire out there where ultimately you know, that the Fed is all hands on deck trying to fight this with the tools that they have. And so, again, I won't harp on this slide, just shows that no matter what time series you use, whether you use things like the trim mean, you try to take out outliers, use medium prices, use CPI, use the Fed's measure of PCE, uh, all the inflation um, uh, measures are above levels we've seen in roughly 30 years, if you took this time series back even further. But more importantly, they're all in alarming territory. So this is why the Fed is acting so, so responsive in this manner. And again, if you look at the components here and why we focus on this is that, you know, the belief of the inflation was that it was driven simply by goods. And that is true. If you look over the last 20 years, you'll see that core goods were actually in aggregate in a deflationary environment. Now, some people are get puzzled and scratch their head when I say that because it's say, well, cost of goods didn't go down. Well, the quality of the goods went up, something that economists call hedonic adjustments. Um, so it does look indeed deflationary if indeed the price stays static. And, you know, there's a, there's a talk about this being the Amazon effect or the decimation of mom and pop retail stores and the commoditization of, of that kind of world. But you see here during the pandemic that our consumption of goods um, with the fiscal stimulus, with the amount of support out there, with people not going into the office and staying more at home, our goods consumption on a price basis went up massively. But notice what's happened all of a sudden is that core services now is starting to really converge with these goods. And this is really a bad sign. Now, you can think, OK, well, core services, it's things that you know aren't goods, it's things that we do. And that's right. And so potentially in here, there's the revenge travel that people talk about that I don't care what the cost of the airline ticket is or the hotel stay or gasoline prices. I'm going to go out and spend money. And that is part of the services. 
But the largest part of services is actually the housing market. And we've been harping on this for, for a couple of years now that just wait until the inflation data catches up to what we've been seeing in the rent and the housing markets. And you're starting to see that. So core services, even with kind of a moderation, is likely to continue to keep inflation somewhat elevated. So we put together this graphic on the next page to kind of show that. And so uh, if you break down, instead of just using services and goods, so the, the gray shaded area is core goods. The yellow and blue is an aggregate core services, right? And the blue uh, is just shelter. So the yellow is services X shelter. So why I put this together, just to show you the impact that housing has on the inflation number. And you can see services is historically, at least over the last 30 years, what has driven the bulk of the inflationary environment. And so again, this is kind of an aberration from, from the good side. But what I, what I want to illustrate here is that the, the shaded areas are the weight of, of that component inside of CPI times that, that uh, CPI rate within that basket. So even today, Let's say that all of a sudden that goods inflation goes to zero. Goods prices flatline from here, right? And core services, X shelter flatline from here. And you can notice that, that that yellow area is typically pretty positive. But again, say it flatline. Well, shelter alone will be driving a 2.5% inflation rate. So even if you zeroed out the other components, we're still at a level that's probably above the Fed's comfort zone. And so, again, with some of the lagged variables that go into rent and owner's equivalent rent within here, what that means is that this number is likely to remain elevated irrespective of what the Fed is doing today. And we saw mortgage rates now hit over a 7% or 7 handle uh, today uh, in the marketplace. It's undeniable that there's going to be some pockets of the housing market that are going to slow in a meaningful manner. But in general, this is a lag time series, so it's going to take time uh, to, to filter in. So that's the bad news and what likely keeps the Fed potentially more aggressive than they need to be. Um, if you go back two Fed meetings ago, the Fed chairman said that, you know, uh, with, with where we are with rates, we're around neutral. And neutral is where they think that policy is just right. It's the Goldilocks scenario. And the market over the next few days treated that uh, as it was like the Fed's almost done with its hiking. Nothing's going to change. What a difference two months make. Right. If you listen to the Fed chairman uh, from last week, he is not talking anything like that, talking that we've got to remain restricted. We've got to be harder and tighter in our policy. And so that's what's happened to the reprice of the bond market as of late. So the good news on the good side is that, you know, some of the supply chain pressures have started to ease here. Uh, you can see here from these conditions. Yes, they're have elevated uh, relative to history, uh, but this is likely a good thing on the good side of the equation and to help kind of bring some stabilization of prices uh, on that part of the consumption. Uh, another positive attribute um, so far in the economy is that manufacturing services, these manufacturing indices, or what they call the PMI indices, still are indicating that we are in expansionary territory. Yes, there's been deceleration. That's why you see from those economic data change series I showed earlier that they've been trending in a downward direction. But you can still see here from the last couple of prints that services is still hanging in there. So these are what we call diffusion indices. Therefore, it just talks about the amount expanding versus the amount contracting. So it does signal that the economic activity is still there, albeit on a muted basis. Um, one thing as you think about uh, CPI is you can think about input costs. And so there's another thing that comes out from these ISM time series, the ISM, where they, they calculate the prices paid. And when you think about the prices paid, these are the input costs. So it tends to be a leading economic or a leading indicator of what's going to happen into CPI. And you can see here that this data set has tended to roll over as of late. And so this is the one thing to be uh, hopeful for is that potentially some of the input costs decelerating back to these kind of more traditional levels could potentially slow down inflation as well. Um, but again, as I showed you, because of that housing market component, there's still going to be a little trade-off on that side of the equation. So there's signs of positive that inflation is indeed rolling over, but some of those stickier components inside of inflation may continue to run uh, or may, may continue to keep inflation elevated. I think at this stage of the game, if the Fed saw like a 3% inflation rate, they'd be ecstatic, right? They would say mission accomplished. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting the job done. Our policies have worked. Um, but in order to get to that level, 
Um, you've got to have a, a lot of consecutive months uh, kind of with a zero or negative inflation print. So what does the bond market think, right? Um, you know, so if you think about the bond market, uh, there's something called the price of inflation. It's called the inflation break-even spread. Um, this is, a you know, as an investor, uh, since you can buy inflation-protected securities or tips, um, it's the differential in, in inflation rates that make you agnostic from buying a tip security versus owning the actual nominal treasury or what we call treasuries. And so the bond market is starting to be convinced that break-even rates are going to get back kind of in line uh, with these more, it's the upper end of historical standards, uh, but indeed it is going to start to get back to the levels that the Fed wants. Now, if you look at one-year break-evens, and again, they're more sensitive to commodity prices or two-year break-evens, you see that ultimately the market is priced in uh, like a 1.6 or lower inflation rate over the next couple of years. So the market is starting to think that ultimately these policies uh, or, or again, it's, it's a slow down the economic activity as well. That's going to drive that down. So, uh, again, that, that is a positive attribute as a bond investor. If you believe that the bond market has the price of inflation, right, that tells you that today you can buy securities that generate real positive rates of return. And again, if you don't believe me, uh, go directly into the tips market. Uh, you can buy a five year tips today. They will give you a one point eight four eight point one point. 84% inflation rate above whatever inflation is for the next five years. But what you see here is the massive repricing of the five-year part of the curve, as well as the 10-year part of the curve when it came to the tip yields. And why this is important is the directionality of real yields is what sets a lot of risk, uh, risk asset pricing and also sets equity multiples as well. And so you can see here that as we get this sharp repricing of real yields upward, it's had pressure on the equity multiple, multiple you had the deceleration yields that's when we had the rally and all of a sudden again now the market repricing real yields to levels we haven't seen uh, really since back in like 2011 uh, is getting to the point where it's having impact on risk markets once again and so again it's very important to focus on this part of the curve uh, to really understand what's driving that that part of the multiple so those are some of the negatives we know that the housing market i'm sorry the, the labor market continues to remain strong uh, if you look at non-farm payrolls, we've seen the growth rates the last couple of months. Some people have been scratching their head about you know, some of those prints given the, the data set out there. But what you find is that we now have more workers than we had prior uh, to the, uh, the pandemic back in March of 2020. And so you started to see labor participation rates go up. Um, this, is, this is good news. However, we all know, uh, just like Fed policy, I, I saw Charlie Evans out this morning saying, you know, reiterating that that uh, policy um, operates with a significant lag, but so does the labor market, right? Um, usually uh, companies don't lay people off uh, because they think a recession's coming. Usually the job losses come once we're already mired in that recession. So uh, the other thing to watch on this side is watching um, unemployment claims. They come out every Thursday. Uh, they come out with a one to two week lag, depending on which data series you're looking at there. And so far, they've been relatively muted as well. So labor participation has picked up. Uh, the amount of uh, employment creation and job creation has come back to kind of pre-pandemic levels. Yes, we're not back on that overall trend line, but it usually takes a significant amount of time post-recession to get there. Look at back in 08. When we went into the recession in 2008, it took almost six years to get back to that pre-peak level in terms of the number of people employed. Uh, this time, it only took a, a roughly around two years to do so. So again, there, there is something about this receleration and the amount of money spraying we did to get there. Um, and so what, what is probably you know, also on Jay Powell's mind, and he speaks to this, so I know it is on his mind. Uh, we don't talk personally, but I listen to him every six to eight weeks at the FOMC. And what I, you know, he's talking about the imbalances of the labor market. And there, there's two, what he's talking about here is that there's too many, uh, there's too many job openings for the few number of people who are employed today. And that gap, you can see there's about 5 million incremental uh, jobs that are sitting out there that are not, uh, we don't have enough workers for. And so when he talks about supply imbalances, you could say, well, potentially we can get labor force participation up. Uh, that can come from more people in the workforce. Uh, maybe, you know, where we had dual income households went to single, they go back to dual. Uh, we got some immigration. That's that's the nice way to think about you know getting imbal getting balance back in the labor market. The other one, the other way, and the way it can happen very sharply is have fewer jobs. 
And so that is increase in the people of looking for work converging with that blue time series. And so um, this is the thing to watch as well, because as long as there's this gap here, it's it's likely to empower the Fed to continue to remain very hawkish in their policy. And this is translated to wage growth. Uh, not shockingly, when you have an imbalance in the, in the marketplace, uh, you're going to have to pay for talent. And so we all know that it's a challenging year in financial markets. Um, you know, there's been good wage growth um, out there across the markets, maybe not in the financial services industry. It's not, it's not a good place for wage growth right now. Uh, but this is also causing concern from the Fed. And so even though these are positive attributes, this is what's emboldened the Fed to continue to be so aggressive. And, you know, essentially, if you look at their dot plots, and I'll, I'll show this in the next section, they're telling that there's another 125 basis points of hikes coming. So this is kind of the setup we have right now in the U.S. economy. Uh, let's talk about what it's done to markets. And uh, this is a chart that just puts into perspective how painful this year is. And this is only updated through yesterday. Um, the bond, bonds were off again today. Uh, the ag was down a little bit more. So I think we're down probably about 15 and a half percent on a year to date basis uh, through the U.S. aggregate index. Notice the perspective here. I mean, not only is this the worst bond market that we've seen since the inception of the U.S. aggregate, it's leaps and bounds worse. Um, people talk about 1994, uh, what a horrific experience that was. I mean, that pales in comparison here, uh, being down uh, at the end of the year, being down about 5 percent. Uh, I think we'd all take that at that point. The bond market was only down 5 percent. And so uh, let's look at what the drivers are. So if you look across the market, uh, there's a lot of carnage in the bond market, right? Whether it's treasuries down 13 percent, agency mortgages down 14 percent, uh, corporate bonds down 18 percent aggregate, triple B's, the lowest credit quality of IG down, and that number's over 20 today. Uh, you look at emerging market debt down 22 percent, corporate bonds in the below investment grade space. Uh, doing a little bit better because they have a little bit less interest rate sensitivity, only down 14%. Um, it's a wonder uh, that, that managers are surviving. Well, what's happened is that if you own some of these floating rate components, things like bank loans, they, they say leverage loans on here, uh, the higher quality has done relatively well. Uh, things that are shorter duration in nature, like the structured products and the securitized space, uh, have done quite well. CLOs, uh, one of the darling childs this year as well. And, you know, non-agency RMBS, if you own some of the legacy ones just because of the prepay environment and their discount securities, uh, they've done relatively well. So if you put it all together, it's been a very, very challenged portfolio, and you really have not reaped the benefits of diversification. And why that is, is because we've had really almost an unprecedented move in the rates market. And so I was digging through the data this morning, trying to see, you know, what years have we seen bigger rate moves than we have in this year? And there was one uh, back in the early 80s uh, where 10 years went up a little bit more. They actually went up about 450 basis points on a year-to-date basis, um, where we've only seen this year, we've only seen, you know, like a 300 basis point rise in the 10-year. Um, but look at the two-year. Uh, the two-year went from a paltry 10 basis points. In fact, at the beginning of the year, uh, it was like, you know, it was sub-50 basis points. And here we are today seen a rate rise of almost over 400 basis points. I think it was actually around 25 basis points at the beginning of the year. So a 400 basis point move in the two-year, uh, that's directly correlated to Fed policy. Uh, you always hear Jeffrey Gunlock speak about this. Uh, the Fed is what's setting expectations to that as well. Uh, it's what allows the Fed to continue the hikes. And that's what's been the pain over the last couple of weeks. Notice that receleration from the pivot point where the, the July Fed meeting, the FOMC meeting, where the market interpreted Jay Powell as being practically done, very dovish uh, interpretation, we got down to almost 275 on the two-year. Since that point, we've went up oh, almost 180 basis points over the course of two months, right? So yes, if you use technicals, bond markets oversold at this point in time across the entire curve. Just look at that. Everything is repriced. Yes, we have an inverted yield curve. Again, another one of those harbinger a potentially, you know, recessionary watch on the horizon. Uh, but in general, this has been a very, very fast sell-off. And so short term, we think that, again, rates are oversold a little bit. Uh, are, are, they're definitely very oversold across this, whether it's twos, tens, or thirties. Um, and there is the position to potentially have a short-term tactical uh, a reversal. And again, this is all going to depend upon where the terminal rate ends with Fed fund policy. Uh, the market right now has about a, uh, well, let me just show you. 
Uh, the market right now has about a 4.6% terminal rate on Fed policy. So what you can see on this chart here is the expectations of the market on where Fed policy will be at each of those FOMC dates. And notice that the market listened to the dot plots. The dot plots are what kind of rocked the bond market last week, where uh, the Fed was conveying that they are not slowing down. Uh, that they, they essentially they're saying another 120 to 120, or excuse me, 100 to another 125 basis points of hikes between now and year end. And the bond market listened, right? Notice that a 425 year end, that's a 75 and a 50. Maybe it's a 50 and a 75. Maybe it's a 100 and a 25, but that's how the market's priced. And if you look here, it's a 75 and a 50. Then there's one more hike early next year, and then they're going to have to slow down. Uh, we did some analysis on kind of historical uh, Fed fund target rates. Once they get to the upper end of the range, how long do they stay there? Uh, it's not a hugely robust sample. It's got about 11 data points. And you find that on average, it's about nine months they stay at that terminal rate. Uh, in the last cycle, uh, if you think about when they were hiking, they hiked through December of 18, and they were cutting rates by March of 2019. So it's only three months in the last cycle. So the, the market tends to look at the last cycle uh, as being more indicative of likely what this one looks like. But you can see here that essentially we're front-loading the hikes. It's a lot of hikes, right? I mean, 425 basis points of hikes or 400 basis points of, of aggregate hikes this year uh, would put it on par with one of the largest rate hikes that the Fed has ever done. And that goes back into the Volcker era. So what this done is this has repriced the front of the curve. It's brought the rest of the curve with it. And it's really changed the profile of the bond market. And so let's just look at the index, right? If you look at where the index was at the depths of the crisis back in 2020, you had a yield of around 1%. Today, the index yields 483. And so, uh, again, remember the, the ag index is roughly 30% treasuries, 30% corporate bond, I'm sorry, 40% treasuries, 30% investor grade corporate bonds, and 30% residential mortgages. And so with that mix shift, that gets you to a yield of about 483. Now, if you think about what I was showing earlier with the expectations of inflation, and let's say you can own this portfolio for, let's say, five years, right? And again, yields didn't move. You were able to reinvest at 43. 43 is a great number relative to the expectations of inflation. So even the index today is getting to a point where it's starting to offer some very relative attractiveness. And uh, what I'll show you is that with careful risk management, as you heard at the top of the hour, uh, our philosophy about running fixed income portfolios, we think you can do significantly better than this uh, in terms of the yield profile with taking commensurate risk in the marketplace. And so uh, why I focus on yield is that if you think about the yield environment, um, it's really a good predictor of forward-looking return. And so uh, just trying to think out a few years, uh, what we did is uh, this is something we put together a couple years ago. Um, when we had client meetings talking about, you know, this very paltry yield, the marketplace, we said, you've got to be careful with the duration of the portfolios for this reason. And so you can see here that the blue line shows you your starting yield. And then what the uh, the, the gold line shows is what your commensurate re or what your annualized rate of return is over the next three years. So it's a three year, uh, uh, three year total return. And you can see here now with the yield that's being offered in the marketplace, now you get to the point where on a prospective basis, you start to feel like you can actually generate some rates of return. So again, it's on the index basis. Uh, you can see the yield uh, at its level. This was month in. Uh, that's why there's about a 70 basis point differential there. Uh, so you can just tack that on there. It implies that a three-year annualized return, even on an index product uh, in fixed income, could be closer to 5% on an annualized basis. So sounds pretty attractive as environment, especially with uh, the potential to generate capital gains if, if yields were to rally, but also just earning the aggregate carry at this point. Uh, however, again, you, you tune into Double Line to listen to what we're thinking about the fixed income marketplace. And you know, if you just focus on the things that are inside of the uh, of the Barclays U.S. aggregate, that is what you see in those gray areas. The the lighter bars are where we were at the beginning of the year in terms of yield. The darker bars show you where we are today. And we drew a dotted line across the highest yielding part of the invest grade corporate bond sector and compare that to where we are into other parts of the market. Things that we use across our suite of fixed income uh, sectors when we think about asset allocation. And notice here, the amount of yield that one can get 
by taking some of these non-traditional credit risks that we say. They're non-traditional because they're not in the index. They're things that we all know, high yield, bank loans, emerging market debt, corporate, sovereigns, asset-backed securities, things like commercial mortgages, CLOs. So notice here, when you get into the investment grade part of the structured credit market today, you're talking about yields in the seven, eight, nine, almost 10% range. So using these in a very careful and calculated manner and pairing that with some of the duration risk, we think is a very prudent way to approach the landscape today. There's a lot going on in markets. We'll update some slides. We'll add some new ones in there. And uh, we'll show you what the Double Line team is doing to earn your trust and allow you uh, uh, try to help you navigate through this environment today. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Speak to you in two weeks.